thank you for joining me again for this last installment of videos about biodiversity and wildlife. We're going to be talking about determining population and we're going to be talking about population growth and ecological niche. A lot of important concepts here to finish up with, but I want to thank you for being attentive and taking notes and really working hard to learn these concepts about biodiversity and wildlife. Why are we talking about this at all? What makes ecosystems and biodiversity important? We talked about this a little bit. Biodiversity itself provides free services to humans. And this is what we don't really remember when we're cutting down forests or making impacts on ecosystems in the environment. They provide these ecological services to humans. What are those services? Water filtration think about these free services that we pay for that we build huge facilities that we spend so much money and time and effort and energy nature does these things for us groundwater recharging it recharges the groundwater for us think about the energy and time and money it takes to build a retention basin where naturally uh, nature will do this for us stormwater control all right, air purification. It'll filter our air. Nutrient recycling. We talked a lot about how nature does that in the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle. Crop pollination. All right, and the importance of bees and other insect species that do those things for us. Soil enrichment. All right, these are the free services, processes by which the environment provides resources or benefit for humans. But another example would be a forest creates timber. Nature provides us with so much food, medicine. If you think about it, it's so important. Biodiversity is so important. So why do we continue to reduce the biodiversity on the planet? And that's the question. Why do we take away biodiversity and these free services? All right, and if, you, if you think a little bit deeper, Nature also provides us with intrinsic value. Value by itself, for us, aesthetic value, cultural value. All right, so why do we continue to take this away? We need to preserve biodiversity and nature. All right, so as we continue this discussion, just I hope that you've been building an appreciation for biodiversity and wildlife, and in this case, the, the services it provides us. So let's talk a little bit about population and population ecology. How do we determine the population of a species, whether it be plants or animals? Uh, there's, there's basically two ways. All right, we can do something called a random plot, and that's more or less for uh, plants or species that don't really move. Those species that do move, we do something a little different. We do something called the mark, return, and recapture technique. All right, and these are for populations that move. And the mark, return, recapture technique is pretty self explanatory where we're going to capture an animal, we mark it with a tag or some sort of mark, we return it into nature, and then we recapture portions of that population and we basically count the ones that are marked and there's a formula for that um, that we're going to want to put in our notes. So the population is going to equal uh, the total of your first trapping, just get this down for now, times the total of a later trapping and we're going to divide that by how many you caught in that later trapping that were marked. Get that down right now real quick and uh, we'll talk more about this. Okay so in determining the population we can ask ourselves how many triangles are on this page and what you can do is you can literally go through here and count and if you did that you would be taking what's called a true census you would be walking around literally counting the amount of ash trees let's say in a forest that true census is the best way to determine population because you're actually walking around taking a true census but that's very hard to do a lot of times we can't do that. You can in species that don't move, such as plants, but even so, if you're working with a large area, it might be better to determine the population from what we call a random plot. 
So if we didn't want to walk around and take a true census, what we could do is take a random plot and you take random sections of the same size. Okay, this is how this is done. Let's say we have four areas in this case, all of the same size. And what we're going to do is we're going to count the number of ash trees in each box. And we're going to average them. So we're going to take the average number in each plot. And then we multiply that by the number of plots. And that should give us an estimate of the population. Now, that is an estimate. Okay, but that's what we're going for, an estimated population where we cannot take a true census. Um, this random plot might be a little bit better of a, of a method. All right, but you need all the same size and random selections, and you plug it into your formula, and you get an estimated population. All right, so that's one way. And here's an example of where it might be difficult to take a true census. You could literally go out and count each tree and take a true census, but it might be easier and more time efficient to take an estimated approach and do a random plot, um, especially if you're doing maybe the ferns, if you want to do the fern plant there. Um, but it might be easier to take a true census and here you see little marks on the trees you might walk through a forest and you see these marks on the trees here's a little slash on this one but you might have you might see remnants of a of a population census uh, in the woods if you're walking through sometimes those marks mean they're going to cut them down but hopefully they were just doing a population study all right here's another way to do the random plot and this is what we're going to be doing in class where you literally take a, we take a trans, what's called a transect line, and we do this in archaeology a lot. You take a transect line and you measure out, let's say, 100 meters, and you do your random plots, your little sections off of that. And you might go in random but defined spaces, and then go ahead and count your number of species in there. And what we do is we take the population density, that's the average number of plants in each plot. That's, the, that's called the population density. And then we multiply it by the total area. And you get an estimated population. So we're going to be doing that in class with the, with the clovers. You know clovers are important because they're legumes. We go in the backyard here at school and we estimate the number of clovers in a 46,000 square foot area. And we see what we get. And it's a nice little activity to do uh, to understand random plots using the transect method. Here's some scientists um, doing some field work. They're using the transect method underwater to understand the population of coral or some type of organism in the reef. And then they're also doing it on shore to estimate the population of some type of organism on the, on the beach there. Many reasons why you might want to do this. Maybe you're looking at the population in this area because there's, it, it's a high traffic area for oil tankers. And if you understand the population before the disaster and after a disaster, you do this again, you can see population decline. Um, and same thing here, as climate changes and our coral reefs are deteriorating, it's important to understand the population of different species so that we can understand how these species are being affected by environmental resistance. Another example, here's an image. Let's say this is an overhead image of cattle. This is a population that's moving, but let's take into consideration we want to do a random plot. Let's say we take an aerial photograph and we can take random sections of here, all the same size. I know my squares are suspect, but let's say those are all the same size. We get an average number in each plot. We multiply that by the number of plots or the total area and we get estimated population. So in this case we did this in let's say 1990 and then 20 years later in 2010 we did this again with an aerial photograph in an area and we saw a population decline. So there's a 
quick and easy way to see how this would be beneficial. All right, but we can't always do that. We don't usually, we don't always have aerial photography. We don't always have animals that are cooperating. Animals move. All right, so what do we do then? We use the mark return recapture technique. And some of you might know this as tag and release. All right, you might hear it or read it mentioned in that way. And that's where we're literally going to tag or mark an animal. So if you've ever seen an animal in nature, here's an eagle with a tag on it, and that tag has a number. But maybe you went swimming with sea turtles, and you saw a little tag on the sea turtle, or in nature you saw a little tag on the ear of a deer, or, or whatever. Um, you literally mark it, you return it to nature, and then we recapture a portion of that population, and you can estimate the population. All right, here's a wolf, and this is humane to do it this way. They've tranquilized the wolf, uh, muzzled it for safety, and they're going to mark this, and while they're marking it, they also do a little health exam there and make sure that the wolf is okay, and then literally release it back into nature. We can find out how many are out there based on a formula. Okay, and again, this is an important concept, determining the population for many reasons. Uh, let's take an example of a deer. The deer have three main predators. We might want to understand the population of the predators. All right, the mountain lion, which is in decline. You don't see too many of those around. And you know when a predator's population decreases, the prey population is going to increase. Okay, we talked about that. And let's say we have the mountain lion and wolves both decline. What's going to happen to the population of deer? It's going to explode. All right, humans are the only other main predator of the deer. So if you think about it, uh, hunting becomes a very important part of keeping the deer population in check because if you don't, you have this J curve, this exponential growth we'll talk about in a minute, the deer population explodes. There are no predators anymore. So very important that humans continue to keep the deer population down. All right, And unfortunately, sometimes the deer population is kept down by humans, not only by hunting, which is very important, but also car accidents. Right, we've all seen deer on the side of the road um, thou by the thousands each year. But that's a, a result of an increasing deer population due to less predators. It's important to understand population dynamics and determining populations. We're going to be doing these in class and looking at examples and performing studies. So hopefully you got notes on these concepts and we'll be applying these in the classroom. Let's move on to a different but very important concept called the ecological niche. And I throw this in here in population because it really gives you a sense of why populations are either small or big. It, it's just a, a super important concept, the ecological niche, and I just felt like that it fit here. And the niche is hard to define. People have trouble with this. Uh, it's difficult to comprehend just because it's multifaceted, if you will. All right, but to put a definition here, uh, we can define it by the role a species plays within an ecosystem. But I said it's hard to define because just saying the role that the species plays isn't isn't enough. All right, that that's definitely true, but it's also where it's found, all right, where where it exists within an ecosystem, along with the role it has within the ecosystem. So if you look at our example down here at the bottom, our little frog here, it exists in an area with high precipitation, all right, high precipitation, and high temperature okay but as soon as you get outside of that niche right that that place within the ecosystem this is what happens right the frog dies so this line here this this edge this border between life and death with the frog in regards to conditions that becomes your law of limiting factors that becomes that area all right if we go back to this concept Right, the frog exists within the optimum levels of some type of limiting resource, but you can live in the stressed zone. All right, hopefully you remember all this. But as soon as you get outside that niche, 
the, the frog can't exist. All right, the frog will not live, will not survive. So throw in the law of limiting factors, too much or too little of any abiotic factor will limit or prevent the growth of a population of species within an ecosystem. All right, so hopefully that gives you a sense. Like I said, this is this is a complex concept here, but let's keep going to try and understand this a little more. And in doing so, I have a graph here, and I'm going to go through this with you. This is called resource partitioning and niche specialization caused by competition. In any environment, let's say there's an organism. All right, and this organism fulfills this niche. All right, so there are certain conditions in where this, this organism lives. But the problem becomes when you introduce another species. And let's say that species exists also within part of the same niche. All right, so right here, you have two different species occupying the same niche. That's called competition. No species likes competition, all right, where these niches overlap. No species likes competition. It might be the same food requirement. With plants, it might be the same light requirement or soil acidity, something like that. And there's something called the competitive exclusion principle. All right, the competitive exclusion principle states that two species competing for the same limiting resources cannot exist. Two species competing for the same limiting resources cannot exist. So what's going to happen is you're going to have divergence of the species within their niche. Okay, the niche becomes more diverged or concentrated. So up at the top here, and I'll switch to green, where you have a more broad area that this organism occupies, you now have a more concentrated area. All right. So what we have done is we've created what's called specialists. And we're going to be talking about specialists in a moment. Um, in a couple of slides. So these specialists now have very specific roles where they were in competition but they had to change in their resource use to now occupy a very specialized piece of the ecosystem. Let's take a look at an example of this okay? because I know that's a lot. Alright here you go. Here's an example of a bird species, the warbler and the different warblers will occupy different parts of the tree. If they all occupied the same parts of the tree, you'd have competition. So what they've done is they've become specialists. So the Cape May warbler will only occupy the top of the tree and at the tips of the branches. All right, so there's no competition with the bay-breasted warbler who feeds in only the middle part of the tree where the yellow rumped warbler is only in the lower part of the tree and at the bases of the middle branches. So if all three were eating from all different parts of the tree, you'd have competition. Instead, you had partitioning, you had divergence, and what we have are specialists so that they can all survive in the same ecosystem but in different niches. All right, let's take a look at another example, the dung beetle in regards to ecological niche. So you ask yourself, what role does this play within an ecosystem? And it actually plays a very integral role. Not role as in rolling dung, but what role does it play within the ecosystem? The dung beetle will take the waste of an animal. All right, let's say this is in the Serengeti in Africa. And there's very poor soil qualities. Um, you know, people need better soil qualities to grow food. So what the dung beetle does is it takes the waste of animals, it will roll it up into a little ball, and it will roll it off into uh, the Serengeti, and it will bury that ball of dung underground and lay its eggs. And that allows the dung beetle to reproduce and survive. Okay, So that keeps the dung beetle's population going. But what it also does is these this waste 
the animal waste is high in nutrients. So when the dung beetle buries the ball of waste, it stays underground, the eggs hatch, the, the dung beetle eggs hatch, but that dung ball stays underground and actually supplies nutrients to the soils. So it fulfills this ecological niche in that it, it, it replenishes soil nutrients, whereas if the, the animal waste was just left in piles where the animals were, you might have localized nutrients, but the dung beetle spreads it out all around the Serengeti and actually adds soil nutrients to a larger region because of its actions. So the dung beetle is, is actually a very valuable, plays a very valuable ecological niche in the Serengeti. So that, like I said, that concept is, is tough, but think of it as the role an organism plays in its ecosystem and the ways it interacts with other species in its physical environment. All right, also, where is it found? So I gave you a couple of examples, but you could think about any organism, any biotic organism and think about its niche. What role does it play? And if you cannot think of one, it might be a very specialized role. It might be very specific. And if you really can't think of one, you might be dealing with what's called an invasive species. So we'll be talking a lot about this stuff in class, so hopefully you're gathering these concepts.